Hello, my name is Suzanne F. Stevens. I am the host and co-producer of Wisdom Exchange TV, as well as the founder and president of Ignite Excellence Group of Initiatives. The Wisdom Exchange is a resource to aid African women to learn, lead, and succeed in life, business, and community. We are in Kampala, Uganda, with our leading lady, Audrey Kahara Kouichi. Audrey is a professional trainer with a focus on enterprise development training. She is now a director of Zebra Solutions. This is a woman you really want to listen to. Welcome so much, Audrey. Thank it's great you. to finally meet you, and congratulations on all your awards. Thank you very much. So what do you see some of the biggest knowledge gaps for women in business? You know, as women, we have multiple roles. You find that uh, most women, they have access to finances, but then you find that the way they decide to run their businesses is what actually is challenging. So management, to me, is key than anything. You need to know how to manage your time. You need to prioritize your tasks so that you're able to run your business very well and run your farm, your home. To me, management is the major power and not finance as most people think. Now, what are some of the skills and techniques they should employ to overcome that, that challenge? First and foremost is time management, critical. Since you have multiple roles, time management is important to you. you as a woman, you need to note down your to-do list every day. What am I going to do and how much time am I allocating to this? But usually they don't, they say, oh, I don't have time to write. And you know, I'm just juggling, I'm running around. So those are some of the things that they really need to do. And another thing that as women we need to do, we also need to know how to keep our books. Uh, women tend to say, I'll hire an accountant. And when they hire the accountant, they hire a man. But if you as a woman, if you don't believe in a fellow woman, and you knew yourself that you can actually manage your books, then why, why do you think other people to respect you as a woman? So that's important that you keep your records. If you are to hire, if it's really important for you to hire, hire a fellow woman to, to, to keep your books for you. So those are some of the things that we need to do. Have a to-do list to-do list and two is to manage our records. My question is, sometimes to-do lists can be very long. So how do you manage that? That's where prioritizing comes in. And you have to know what is important to you and what is urgent. Some things may be urgent, but not important. So then focus on the ones that are actually important and then make sure you do it. You know, in the African context, there's too much of that urgent things, that, but they're not important. Like your friend has lost a, a grandmother. And you know, they, they tend to make it important. We have to go for burial. You have to go. No, you have to look at is it, is it important? Do I have other important things to do? Because you could do it in a different way. You could go there on a Sunday when you're not so busy to say, okay, to sympathize. And you know, don't need to travel like two days to go and, and help your friend to bury the grandmother. You have to prioritize and look at things differently. I know there's a lot of sentiments in those issues, but as a woman, you really need to be in control of that. You can't be all things to all people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I like the urgent and is it, it is an important. I believe I saw a grid like that at one yes. point. Yes, it is. Okay. Now, once a woman is successful in business, what do you see as still some of the skills required to grow their business? What uh, I've noticed is actually how to manage success. Most ladies get there and they're very successful and then I mean, they blow it up when they are, have systems in, in their businesses that will help them for their businesses to get better and better. It's how to manage success is very critical. And unfortunately, many people never get to know how to manage this success. As they say that power gets to your head, mm -hmm. and this success gets to your head, and at times you don't know what to do. That's why you see most of them, they start mismanaging the money, they start mistreating the workers, they think maybe now they don't need to be so much into their businesses. They get strong at the end of it all. And maybe this a time they need to delegate more. They need to master the management skills more at this particular time so that they are able to actually do it. Can you give us two systems that you think would be worthwhile for somebody who has been successful? One of the systems that I really believe in is how to keep your records. Mm -hmm. Have a system that everybody in this chain, let's call it a chain, mm -hmm. just for purposes of, of elaboration, is have this chain and everybody knows exactly what to do. If you're receiving the money, the receipt should be written. 
at the end of the day, who is going to balance these books? Then after that, where do you push these records to? So that when it comes to the financial records, it's very, very easy. If you are into, into say, a, a service business, if a customer comes in, what do you do to them? Or if you get an inquiry, what's the first thing that you should do? All this should be well documented. If you have a school and you're a woman, you should know that when you get the assembly, what should the teacher say? When the pupils report on the first day, what should they do? All this should be documented and well streamlined. So the production side should be well documented and also the financial side should be well documented. If you have those two systems right, it's very, very easy for you. To manage but the, the processes and, and getting those systems and learning about how to put a system in place, yes, yes. where would they learn how to do that? And there are very many consultants around who can do it, but we also do it in Zebra Solutions. Right. But you find there are also other business development providers who can actually help you to have your systems in place. But you could still have a mentor. Mm -hmm. You could have a, a mentor to help you do that. People who have done it successfully could learn from them. And some women have done it successfully, so you could learn from them. More and more women are becoming entrepreneurs, and you focused at the university, small to medium. What would it take for some of those entrepreneurs to be big business? What's stopping women from becoming big business players? You know, as women, we are very unfortunate. While the men go out to their the golf clubs, go to the private clubs, go out to the bars to have a drink. For us women, we are rushing home to go and look after the children, look after those husbands who are out there in the golf club. So as women, that's why building our own strong networks is very, very critical for us. You should belong to a professional association, that is key. And don't miss those meetings because they are important. You could use the internet if you don't have the time. You could be on Facebook, you could be on LinkedIn, uh, you could be on Twitter. All this can help you actually to network with fellow women. If there is any social event, create the time to be there. Because that's the moment for you to network, tell others what you do. And that is going to help you to build your business. Because bu building a business is about creating a customer. You have to create a customer. So how do you create this customer? Through networking, through talking to others, being in those social events, people getting to know you. That's what they have to do if they want to grow their businesses. Being in the kitchen will not help them to grow their businesses. You have to get out there. Now, creating a customer, I love that. Do you have some strategies for people to create a customer? Uh, the best way to create a customer, first and foremost, is telling them about what you sell and bring out the good aspects of what you sell. If you're selling water, don't tell them I'm selling water. But what is it that is different from the water that is on the market? that you actually see. So bring out the uniqueness in your product or service that you're selling that will make somebody get attracted to you instead of your competitor. Then once you get this custom, never let them go. Pamper them, love them, follow them up, check on them all the time so that they never. Once you have a customer, never let this customer go. And be sure your business will grow. Because this one customer who is happy will tell 10 others. But if you annoy one customer, you lose a hundred of them. So make sure you keep them and you have ten times, ten times, ten. Now, I know you focus on entrepreneurship. Usually what I focus on is my entrepreneurship is mainly small and medium uh, enterprises. Uh, because I'm a certified trainer under the ACTAD, mm -hmm. uh, under the ACTAD program. So what we mainly focus on is to see that we get these small and medium enterprises to turn them into growth businesses. That's what we focus on. And we focus on the behaviors of an entrepreneur. Because all the successful entrepreneurs, whether in Africa or the US, they all behave in the same way. They have those characteristics or behaviors that can be found in Bill Gates, in Warren Buffett, they are all there. So those are the behaviors that we try to impart on. Now, I'm no Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, yes. but I am an entrepreneur. Yes. So I'm curious, what are some of those characteristics that you, you yes. observe? And if you could do it this way, some of the positive characteristics, and also some of the ones that limit us yes. in getting in the way of our own success. Actually, that's what we call the dark side yes. of each behavior. Like um, goal setting, all successful entrepreneurs do set goals, all of them, whether in Africa, whether in Europe, whether in 
America, they set goals. That's one of it. And then they are persistent. That's another, another one. They are persistent. But the dark side of persistence is that you could persist and you should know where to stop. Because you could persist and persist and you lose a lot of money because you are persisting. But you should have, you should know where to stop. To say, I think I've persisted enough and I should stop here. That's the dark side. Another one is that they are moderate risk takers, successful entrepreneurs. But for sure you have to take a risk in order to be able to, to make some money. So they are moderate risk takers, that's another behavior. Another one is that their self-confidence is so high. They are very, very good at, at, at that they have the self-confidence. And they're good at networking. A successful entrepreneur, you will never find them hiding behind closet. No, they are out there socializing, talking to people. That's how they get opportunities. That's how they're able to create customers in, in their businesses. Another one is they're very, very good at seeking opportunities. Mm -hmm. They are always looking out for opportunities. And they look for these opportunities not by copying others. You know? They look at these opportunities, they start from problems. What are people's problems? What are some of the resources that are not well utilized in the environment and we can use them? So that's how they, what's the gap out there? What is the competitor missing out? What is the competitor not giving to their customers? Then they target on that and then they'll be able. So there are mainly 10 behaviors that we focus on, that we look into, but I've just given you some of them. Could you give me one more dark side? Oh, another dark side is that um, when it comes to persuasion, at times you may be, you may be very good at persuading others because that's one of the behaviors of successful entrepreneurs. Others do misuse it, and they use it in such a way that they are maneuvering you. They're they're taking advantage of you. So that's also another dark side. I think that's you know all very insightful points. What influence really is is how the other person likes to buy. And pushing, if that person doesn't like to buy in that way, you actually will shut them down and they, they will remove themselves from the situation as quickly as possible. And that is probably a key area where African salespeople uh, can learn. I'm not sure as much as in Uganda, but I know in Kenya they definitely can learn when to push and when not to. I don't know if you have that challenge here on the more on the micro level here. Yes, but sometimes people don't know when to stop. Yeah. You know, like a, a simple example is these people who are walking along the, the roads. I think you've seen them. Mm -hmm. You tell them you don't want to buy, say, the peas. At times they say the peas. You say, I don't want the peas. But they will insist. Buy a cup. Buy a half. Give me some money. You know, I've not got any money today. Mm -hmm. It's not about you not getting money today. I don't need it. And you should listen to me. We sing from the same song sheet. <laughs> what skills do you think would help women boost their leadership skills? You know, you, you focus a lot on entrepreneurship, but eventually, and hopefully if they're successful, they're going to have to lead. So what are some of the skills that you think are really important in leadership? For you to succeed, succeed as a leader, you have to let others help you work with you. And that's very, very important. And unfortunately, at times you may not get it right to build a good team. So they really need to know how to build a team. It's, it's good to go out with your staff. So you take out of this working environment and go out for an evening. Maybe you could go out for a picnic on a Saturday. That helps, you know, because when people are in office, they seem to be usually tend to guard. You know, they, they build something around themselves to say nobody should, should know me. But when you take them out of this environment, they open up. Mm -hmm. You get to know the better part of them, and you, you, then you know how to relate with them better. So that's another skill that they need is actually interpersonal skills. That is very, very critical as women. Uh, we, we tend to, some people do take advantage of us because uh, we do have the empathy. You know, we empathize and we go beyond. So at times people do take advantage of that, but we should know where to stop. We should be in control, we should know that I think that, that person should, is taking advantage of me and I should stop them. So that you still remain a leader, but at the same time good to your staff. Have you found or do you suspect that women may not want to, as leaders, demand more personal time of other people because they need to get back to their own families, so they assume 
that their team also has other responsibilities and may not want to spend some of their personal time with their organizations. Yes, that is very, very true. That's very true. Because if, if she's leaving, she wants everybody to leave, so she's not guilty. Provided you have a good explanation for leaving early, then that, that is okay with you. You can leave early. But you could also allow your team to use their time effectively. Make sure that when they are there, they're working effectively. Delegate so that you don't you don't uh, have to leave. Because if you leave early and you still have work, that's where the guilt comes in. But if you leave when you've done all that you had to do, then you, you leave your office satisfied. So you have to pass on the skill to your staff so they learn to work effectively within the required time, their eight hours or six hours. So a successful entrepreneur often is a very good networker, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. But a lot of people are terrified <laughs> or just uncomfortable with networking. Do you have any advice on how to network? There's, there's a book I read uh, that uh, told me something to do about networking. The way you can teach yourself on how to network. They say go into a shopping mall and on, say, an afternoon, go there at 2, because as usually those are the busy times in the mall, and meet at least five people you don't know, smile at them, greet them, and tell them something about what you do. And you know that will help you to say, oh, it's easy. But if you've not done that, it's usually hard. That's why you find people at a social function, they're in a corner, because they're terrified to go out and talk to people. But the best way to start, go to a mall, one Saturday afternoon, talk to five people, smile at them, greet them properly, and tell them what you do. Mm -hmm. So if you could do that uh, for, say, five Saturdays, I'm sure now you'll be confident mm -hmm. to do it elsewhere comfortably. Now your expertise is in sustainable agriculture practices, pest control, post-harvest handling, amongst many yes. other things. Can you give us sort of two uh, practices uh, that companies should be implementing when it comes to sustainability in agriculture? And then two in pest control and two in post-harvest handling? Well, post-harvest handling starts actually from the time uh, when your crops are still in the field. It's very, very important to get those crops at the right. I'll just give an example of maize. I think it would be better if you but like maize, get it at the right moisture content. Mm. Make sure it's handled in a good way. Don't just throw it on the ground and then it gets dirty. All that brings about losses. So the handling has to start right from the time when you're harvesting from the garden. That it's done in a clean way. When you're drying it, you dry it in a, in a, in a clean surface and make sure when you're keeping it, you store it in the right moisture content. Raised, not on the floor, but should be raised, so that it has moisture cannot form within the cereal. So those are very, very key steps, mm -hmm. right from the garden up to the time when you put it into your warehouse to store it. And then about pest control, here in Africa, rotation works better that if you plant beans in this plot this year, don't plant beans next year, plant something else. And don't plant something that is in the family of beans. Maybe next year what you could do, you could plant in potatoes. So that that helps the pests that feed on beans, will, at least the population will go down. Because next, next season, they will not have anything to feed on. So most of them will die. Then you can plant beans again. So that's the best way to, to manage the, the pest. Another one is to plant like cotton can be planted with maize. That's just another way. That's the biological pest control. Those are also good ways to know if you can intercrop two crops and one fits onto the other pest. That can also help. But the sustainable one is mainly if um, if you have if you are into crop crop growing crop growing and then you also rear animals. Mm -hmm. So you get the, the, the dung from the animals, use it as manure into your gardens. Mm -hmm. That also helps. So the fertility of the soil will continue to, to be there because of the dung that you put in as manure into, into your garden. That's also very, very important. That's why 
we usually encourage people to have animals and also to grow crops. So what comes out of the animals goes back into the garden, what gets out of the garden goes to the animals. What has been the most significant impact you feel you've made in your career? At least where I've, wherever I've been I've left a mark because I worked with the Ministry of Agriculture and I left a mark there because I was still recognized there because of my performance. And then I came to the university and I've left a mark here at the university and I've left a mark by getting two awards. But also what I've created in all these parts I still see. Because when we helped the ladies, uh, the women in Ginger, in the women's heifer project, you know, we we'll donate a, a heifer to a family. And then that, so using that heifer would bring in family planning, would bring on this family life education to make sure that the home is clean, sustainable agriculture, that they get the manure and use it into their crops, increase on their crop productivity. So uh, up to now, it's still, it's, we formed an association of these women so that they can continue when the project ends and this is still running up to now. Mm. The storage jars that we worked on with the women, they're still existing, they still store their crops in these jars. And now when I look at the entrepreneurship center, maybe it's still fresh that I've just left the entrepreneurship center, but I still see the, the impact. I've worked with several women. Uh, that's why when you showed me the list, I said I knew all those women. Mm -hmm. So and uh, so that that is that, that gives me satisfaction, especially when I see a lady that I've trained and she's running her business successfully or the young girls that are being trained here, and then you see them successful in life, their managers, that, that puts a smile on your face. You've done lots of training sessions and, and projects. How do you prepare yourself to work with a group of people? I'll tell you, there is no shortcut to preparation. If I have a training to do, I would prefer if you let me know two weeks in advance. Because mentally I have to be prepared. I may have the knowledge or the information that I have to the slides ready or, or my games ready that I will use. But I need to be prepared psychologically. Think about the relevant examples I will give. You have to make sure you have your training material ready. If you are going to give out any handouts, you should be ready. You should make sure your examples are relevant to that group. You should know about the group. That's why it's good to have the profile of the group in advance before the training so that uh, you know them. Otherwise, you may say words that, uh, that offend some of your participants. Then before the training, you should go to the training room the day before. Have a look at the training room. What kind of sitting arrangement would you like to see? Will, be, will everybody be, have a good view of all the presentations? That is very, very, it's a lighting right for the room. And all that. And the, understand the breaks, what will they have? If you are not the one involved, will they have a lunch break? Will you provide lunch? Are the toilets clean? The, that, those are things that they are simple, but they are very critical. So how do you measure the success of a program that you implement? I know most people like the paperwork, but it's the way I feel. I, words are not spoken, but you can feel it. Mm -hmm. So that's how I measure it. How I feel at the end of it all is very critical to me. The interactions during the breaks with the participants. If they're asking you questions, they want to know more about things, then you know, yes, I'm doing a good job. But if you find the participants are always shining away from you and during the break time, you know there's a problem. Mm -hmm. That means you're not connecting with, with your participants. Then of course the evaluation is also, you should have an evaluation form, a daily evaluation form, so that uh, you don't wait for the end. So if you get an evaluation every day, then you can improve and do better the following day so that you can adjust on your training techniques. What would you say would be the most challenging aspect of your career? Most challenging is when I'm presented with audiences that I'm not used to, especially audiences that uh, don't come from the business line, they're not business oriented, I'm usually challenged. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more comfortable with business people, but if I'm told to go and train public servants, to go and train lawyers, uh, that challenges me. But at times it's good to have those challenges because that puts you on your toes. Then two is when I get new projects, 
you know, you, you write a proposal and then all of a sudden you're successful. But the way I've learned to deal with projects is I rely so much on the team. Mm. When I get a new project challenging, I really rely so much on the team and I let them know. I say, I'm, I'm really relying on you. I know I will lead in this, but I'm really relying. Try to visualize the outcome, and you know you have two visions: failure and success. And you know you don't have an option to pick success. Mm -hmm. So when we were chatting earlier, that was sort of a bit of your edginess insight as well. The thing that you had to do to that's uncomfortable, but you continue having to do in order to be successful. I'll never forget the first time I was speaking to a group of men. Very, this was early on in my career, and they were all executives. And I thought, why would they listen to me? And then all of a sudden, you go in and you give it all you have, and you realize they're not an expert in it. You have more knowledge than they do. You can teach anyone. Like one time, I was going to teach some people because they had the, um, more experience, they had more money than I do have, you know, they drive better cars than I do have. And uh, I was getting to them, and I said, Oh my God, what am I going to tell them? And I might get in there and say, Oh, what is she going to tell us? And then uh, uh, this colleague of mine says, Don't worry. better cars and they have all this, but they don't know what you know. To your point is, they don't know what you know, yes. and they don't know what they don't know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Has there ever been an initiative that you implemented that you felt didn't work or achieve the objective that you intended, and could you describe that to us and what you did? I was given a consultant to do, and uh, this consultant was to do with the training skills. I was supposed to go to different organizations find out uh, which areas they were training in and then come up with this report, which I did. I gave it to a few of my friends, they read through, they said, yes, I said, do you think I've captured, I usually do that, do you think I've done, I've captured the objective, they said, yes, you've done it. So they, so it was an EU project. So the person uh, who was in charge, I gave it to him, I said, this is the, my first draft. And uh, before he gave me the comments, he circulated it, I think, to his team. And one person came out so strongly on this report. He says, no, it's not a good report. This is all the bad words came out about this report. And I'm telling you, I, I got this information from an email. So I opened my email and there were the, these words. And, uh, you know, you, you, I, I got a stomach pain immediately. Mm -hmm. I started sweating. I didn't know what to do. I was following good enough, I read it in the night. So I, I didn't sleep, I couldn't sleep. I woke up in the morning, I was so low, I couldn't tell anybody what had happened. I just said, I, I don't know, what should I tell people? This. I said, okay, let me call the people that I gave to read through my report first. And I said, do you remember the report I gave to? I said, were you genuine? They said, yes, yes, we are genuine, and we thought so. And then after some time, I got the guts to call the person who was supervising the project. I said, have you read that email? He said, I've read it. He says, don't worry about that gentleman. He's always like that. He's very, very negative. But it left a mark on me up to today. And I don't know why. Well, what I'm more amazed at is that you've only, it sounds like you don't often get negative feedback. Because I would think that that, that mark, it, it bugs you. And I understand that because it's always that one person that says something that, that gives you feedback when we ask for feedback and gives us the feedback and we take it personally. How do you deal with feedback? Now that night you didn't sleep, but what would you recommend for people to, t you know, you're, you're promoting ask for feedback, ask for feedback, but sometimes you don't want the feedback because if you can't deal with the feedback, then you're gonna have a bigger problem. I think for this case it's because I got positive strong the other side, mm -hmm. and there it really hit me hard, mm -hmm. saying, did I miss something from what the other people were telling you, mm -hmm. told me or something. 
But usually I like feedback so much. Even where here in the center, I've always wanted feedback. And I believe in it so much. But I think it's because other people read through the document and they say it, it was okay. And now here I am. So you know that confusion when you don't know exactly. That's why the feed, when you're giving somebody feedback, it's very, very important for it to be clear that the other person understands where it's coming from. That helps quite a lot. But in terms of getting feedback, I do like feedback because it helps you to know your weak areas, areas of improvement. It helps you to, to, to know that so that you can do better next time. Otherwise, if you don't get feedback, you can never do better. Yes. However, I'm just going to be a bit of a devil's advocate okay. on this because feedback, if you get negative feedback often or or if it affects you physically that you don't sleep, do you have any suggestions on how to deal with getting negative feedback? Because when you put yourself out there, you're not only going to get positive feedback, no, no. you're going to get negative feedback. And yes, it's great to say, I'm going to use this to improve. And I, I, I honestly believe that's the trainer language. Yes. I'm going to use this to improve. But sometimes we're human. Yes, that's true. And if you're leading a team or you're training or whatever it is, feedback can weigh you down. Yes, it can. So do you have any suggestions on when you get feedback, how to actually deal with that feedback so you can still, mm -hmm. you can take it as a positive experience? Okay. I'll, I'll give you another example. I was training some people in northern part of Uganda, and uh, I was telling them on how to. Imp imp these are head teachers for primary schools and their deputies. So I was going throughout the district, telling them on how to, to improve on the performance during the P7. P7 is the final for primary school. How they could, their schools could do better because the district had done so badly, so they brought in two to go and talk to the head teachers. So when I was telling them, I went with a small book. There's a small book that has all questions for primary living examination for the last uh, like 10 years. So I went with these small books and I was showing the head teachers. This is a, a, a book that schools in Kampala use. They use them actually right from P6 before people do the primary living examination. So it would be good if you could start now and use them with by P5, P6, then they, by the time they get to P7, they are familiar with most of the person. So in one of the schools, one of the head teacher is, is and say, don't tell us about Kampala schools. Uh, because for us, you don't know our challenges here. We have more challenges than people in Kampala. And you can't tell us, you don't know what we're going through here. You don't even live here. Okay. And uh, I saw that everybody was was uh, taken aback, saying, "Oh!" So I, what I did is uh, I I kept quiet for, uh, intentionally for about five minutes, and you know everybody just stared at me, and we just looked at each other. I just kept quiet, and I said, it's, "That is a that's a very very good point you've raised, and I'm very very sure you have reasons why you have raised it." I know one of it is that I don't understand the challenges here. Maybe let's look at some of the challenges that you do have here. And so we switched and started discussing some of the challenges there. Then eventually I brought in the book that they had to use. That's another way to handle feedback, that you get to understand where the person is coming from with those comments. Mm -hmm. yes. And then that, that can actually help you to, to see how to move forward. So and it, yeah, I like what you, and I like what you're saying is understand where the person's come from, and I'll just add a little caveat to it: asking more questions, especially when you're confronted in a face-to-face -face situation. Ask more questions mm -hmm. because if you put the energy on them, mm -hmm. it's not on you. <laughs> especially if you are taken off guard, mm -hmm. off guard it, it, it can help by just focusing on that. Yes. I, I always. Um, believe it's not what happens to you, it's how you deal with it. <laughs> Which is great. What would you say was the most significant thing that happened to you or for you that helped you achieve the accomplishments that you've achieved in your career? I do not give excuses for not doing something. I'm not embarrassed to say I do not. I do that. 
whether it's my junior staff, I would still say no to. I said, you have a better alternative that we could use or something. I, I am not embarrassed to do that. But maybe it's also because I also read. I read a lot. At any one time, I have a book that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. If I have a challenge too, I also read a book. Mm -hmm. I look for the relevant book to, to read that can help me uh, sort out this challenge and also use my mentors. That's also another thing. But also, it's also to ask people. Uh, I, I have this tendency to say, I want the right track. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of us know that. Are, are, we, are we doing well? Are we on the right track? Are we on the right track? Do you think that's fine? Do you think that's okay? I always ask that. Actually, one of my friends says, I know what you're going to ask next. Are we on the right track? <laughs> so, those are some of the things maybe that have helped me achieve what I've been able to achieve. But it's important to have mentors. It's important for you to, to keep on reading. And it's important for you to evaluate yourself whether you're on the right track or not. And don't, don't be embarrassed to ask your colleagues. Because some people don't fear asking because they say, oh, then they think I'm not confident enough. And that, that doesn't mean you're not confident. What are two books that you would recommend to listeners that you really enjoyed? A Million Dollar Habits by Brian Tracy. I think that's a book everybody should read. Another book that I would like people to read is The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Mm -hmm. That's another book that people should read. Those two books I really highly recommend. Like you're you're going into an interesting place because you're working, you're going to be an entrepreneur. Yes. So you're stepping out from this safe haven. <laughs> Pet check at the end of the month. <laughs> <laughs> and there's going to be challenges. There, there's always challenges when you start your own your own initiative. But to this point, what has been the biggest oh. obstacle that you've had to deal with to get to this this success? The biggest obstacle has been balancing family and work. That has been my biggest obstacle. Because with the kind of work that I was doing here, as you can see, I've, I was involved in so many activities. Um, entering people, lecturing, administrative work, consultancy work, research. You know, and then you have also the the voluntary work that you do, it was quite a lot. So being able to balance family and, uh, and, and work was my biggest, biggest challenge. But what I noticed is that you learn along the way. As, as time goes, there are times when I would leave this office at 1 a.m. I work on Saturday, I work on Sunday. But then as time goes on, you realize that what you're doing is not right. And then you find ways of saying, then I stopped working on Sundays. So I'm saying, telling everybody, Sunday is a family day, whatever it takes. But one thing I never overcame, that is I have to be very honest, is to work in bed. Um, working till 2, 3 a.m., that is one thing that up to now, that's one thing I still find challenging, uh, mm -hmm. because I think I've I turned into a habit, that I'm now nocturnal, I've worked better in the night, so I'm, I'm still struggling with it, but I think I'll get there. So now I'm working towards not going to bed after midnight. <laughs> How do you define leadership? Leadership to me is uh, having these people following you and they believe in you. To me that's leadership. Which leads to leadership lessons. Learned as a leader, what do you find are the three most powerful pieces of advice you can give to someone trying to lead a project, a team, or an initiative? Do not micromanage if you are leading a project. Let everybody be clear of their tasks and what you expect from them. That has to be very, very, very clear, and it's better for it to be in measurable terms, so that and with a time frame. So they know by this time I should have done so much and this is the way I'm going to measure it. So at the end of it all, you don't need to ask them on a daily basis, what have you done today, what have you done the other day? Because they know that you have a time for evaluation, say, uh -huh. where are the results? So it's better to avoid micromanaging. Because if you micromanage, it takes a toll on you as a leader. So give them this uh, confidence that actually you believe in them, trust them that you can do it and you'll be surprised they will do it. Then another one is that you need to have more than four hands to hold you up. 
to sustain you there. That's why you need to build a strong team. You remember earlier I talk, talked about meeting your staff outside the working environment? That's the way to build a team. You could go out for a picnic, you could have dinner out together. Those are some of the simple things that you could do that help to bond, they help to bond uh, this team. Then thirdly is to be receptive to feedback. Like in the center what we do is we have something that we do, we say start, stop and retain. So every person writes about the other, what they would like them to start doing, what they would like them to stop doing, and what they would like them to maintain doing. So that is feedback. And good enough you never get to know who exactly said that. But the fact that you get to read it, you say, oh, okay, this is what people think about me. And as they say, weaknesses, some of them you may not be able to change your weaknesses, but at least you may know how to manage them. And then you could let your team know that actually I have this weakness and I appreciate you've mentioned it out in our start, stop, maintain, but please help me to manage it. So it, it becomes a, 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 an enjoyable environment to actually work. I see a big opportunity for to start, stop, and maintain, to leave it for your spouse. <laughs> oh, yes, I think a spouse, that could be a good one. <laughs> Just leave a note, but don't let them know who wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, Zebra Solutions is next for you. Yes. But what else is next for you? Uh, mentoring. Um, now we have, we have a mentoring pro uh, program under UL. So I'm deeply involved into mentoring the women in this association. Excellent. So after creating Zebra Solutions, it's so going to allow me to have more time to do some of those things that I now would say I wish I would mentor more women. And so now I'm going to have more time to be able to do that. Because I don't have to report somewhere 8 to 5 and you have somebody telling you to do this and then the other is pending. So here I am in control. I've, I've tried to think through it, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll, I'll see how to, 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 to manage to manage it. I don't want to lose that control, and I don't want to lose those things that I always wanted to do that I was unable to do. I don't want to. I want to have that on top of my mind. So I don't want to lose that. Now, given the chance, what would you love to do that you haven't done yet? But well, there's one thing that uh, I always want to do is to climb a mountain. I always want to to, 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 to do that. Uh, I hope one day I'll be able to. Do. I don't mind. I don't want to get to the peak, but at least if I could spend a whole week climbing a mountain and getting to a certain height where I'll be able to have a very good feel, that's one thing I would really like to, to to achieve. So, if you had a daughter ten years old today, what words of wisdom would you give her? People should shouldn't describe who you are. You should be the one to that. So I tell her that you can do anything, whatever you want to do, you can. People shouldn't tell you you're a winner, you can't do this. You can do whatever you want to do. Forget about your sex present. You can do anything. Because I say, look at the women. We've had women who are violent, we've had women who have done all sorts of things. That means you can, you can still do it, provided that's what you want to, to actually do. That's, that's, to me, that's, I believe is the most important thing instead of for reminding you that you're a woman, you can't do this. No, 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 you're a woman and you're driving that car. No, 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 you shouldn't be driving a big car. She, a woman uh, driving a bus, people think it's a big thing. No, you see, that shouldn't, your sex shouldn't be tied to what you can do and what you can't do. I love that you said that, but I also love how you said it is don't let other people define you yes. and, and even beyond gender yes. because people tell us describe who we are you are this yes. all, the time. all the time and you don't know me well enough to know to label me mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. label me so I, I really really like that what do you wish someone told you when you were 10 years old i wish at 10 years old um, somebody had just told me it'd be the same thing that others shouldn't I just wish at 10 years old somebody wasn't always telling me that uh, go and cook. You have to cook, you have to learn how to cook. You know, here in our culture, that's key. You, you, by this day, you have to be peeling, and then the boys are not peeling. For them, they're out playing. 
I, I wish we were doing the same thing, that the boys would peel too and would also go and play. You know, I wish that was done to, to me at that time. If there is anything that you could change in your career, would there be anything that you would change? No. Because I changed my career. Uh, I was into agriculture full time and then I moved to, to business. So that's when I did the MBA. And when I did the MBA, I found a new world and I'm very happy with that new world that I found. Business, you know with business that there are challenges all the time and they're not obvious. You don't have an obvious answer. You could have three answers to the same problem. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to choose one. So it's, that's business, you know? And what I like about business is I, I, I somehow understand the environment that I live in better. You can understand inflation, you can understand exchange rates. When they talk about now the economy prices going up, you can have an explanation, an explanation for it. Mm -hmm. So I am more comfortable and I'm very happy with this way. Final question is, what words of wisdom would you like to impart to African women? I want them to believe in themselves. Believe in yourself. And and then others will believe in you and then they will follow you. But if you don't believe in yourself, then nobody will follow you, no one. And then two is have a role model, have a mentor, and for the different aspects of your life. And it's very, very critical because you cannot have a mentor who is all round, good in the family aspects, good at work, good at the social aspects, no. So you could have a mentor for your social aspects. You say, I, I like the way so and so carries herself in public. It's for the way she dresses. You know? Mm -hmm. So let that be your mentor. So when you have this challenge, you say, what would uh, my mentor, uh, Suzanne, do in this moment? You know? So those are some of the things that, if it's career, then you have a mentor. You say, what would she be doing this time? What, how would, where would she have really want to go? This time. So it's good to have a mentor in each and every area of your life. Thank you, Audrey. So, so much. My name is Suzanne F. Stevens, and I co-produce Wisdom Exchange TV along with my husband, Michael K. Ginrich. We're traveling through Africa interviewing people just like Audrey, women who as you can tell, just don't stand still, change and evolve and keep adding to their success. And these are the women we want to interview. So if you know a woman that has is a leader, a trailblazer, a pioneer who started something of significance, please email us at info at wisdomexchangetv.com. Also, if you work for an organization or lead an organization that would like to get access to leading women all over Africa for the ABW Connected Summit taking place in Ethiopia in 2013, please email us again at info at wisdomexchangetv.com and inquire about our sponsorship package. There's a lot of information on the website. Or if you'd like to advertise on this site, please also inquire and we'll provide you with some information. Again, my name is Suzanne F. Stevens and I want to leave you with my words of wisdom. Learning is not a one-time thing, it's a lifetime thing. So I challenge you to do something new and learn something new every week about a person, about a culture, about a technique. It'll make you a better person and you'll be like the women we're interviewing on Wisdom Exchange TV. Thanks for joining us.